Thanks for tuning in. I'm Martin Hamilton, and welcome to the CGMA Jam Session, where we dive into the creative mindsets of artists from around the globe. Today's guest is Manuel Tausch, a senior and lead effects technical director and co-founder of Stormborn Studios. Manuel, is hey, how's it going? Of... Yeah, well, hey, Manuel. Uh, nice to hello. have you here today. Um, <laughs> out of the day, you've worked on such a number of impressive titles, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Doctor Strange, Captain America Civil War, Age of Ultron 2, um, and just so many more. Um, and also, Manuel, you're a CGMA instructor, teaching our upcoming course, Intro to FX Using Houdini, starting soon. That is right. That is right. It's actually just now it is running for the second time. We started, I started out in February for the first semester and uh, we had about, I think, 30 people in the course and they all really, really enjoyed the whole content. It, the course goes over roughly nine weeks and we basically try to, it's, it's really a fast track course. So we, we start with the really basics and fundamentals in Houdini and then we walk ourselves all the way through um, to way more complex things, but I don't want to really. Um, you're kind of leading where we're gonna go with this uh, with this session, so I leave that up to you, Martin. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I love hearing about your class, and um, I really look forward to talking to it. But first, I'd just love to talk to you about becoming sort of an effects artist and eventually transitioning to your lead position that you're at now, because I feel like that's such like a teacher role being a lead, and I just love to hear about it. So first, I like to start off sort of with your schooling. Did you go to your college career with an effects school in mind, or were you sort of drawn to it once you got there? Uh, so basically, the way I started, I was kind of very interested in the whole media industry. I, I wasn't really sure what sort of uh, trajectory I would uh, go through. And then I, st I started at a uh, private school in Germany, Munich, called the SAE Institute. And over there, they basically taught you the basic usage of programs such as actually a wide, uh, a wide variety of programs such as editing programs such as uh, Final, Final Cut Pro. Um, then we had uh, some sort of web design stuff where we learned flash programming and HTML. And then we had the more 3D courses um, or workshops where we kind of learned the basic of uh, 3ds Max and then we had Maya as well in the curriculum. And then also we learned how to use a camera, how to kind of set up a shot, how to, we learned about golden ratios and compositions and stuff like that. And in the end, I was basically propelled into the market as a freelancer and was lucky enough to start working as a motion graphic artist uh, such as yourself, um, doing stuff for uh, German TV productions, basically. Wow, so it sounds like when you first got into it, you're really sort of more of a generalist and trained almost sort of in everything that you need to know to sort of be in the electronic industry. Um, and then oh, yeah. so going off of there, what really, so it sounds like you started working as a generalist. So what really inspired you to make the jump and start working in effects? So basically the way I see it, when I worked as a generalist, I was always kind of tackling the same sort of tasks and things became very repetitive. And also the tasks that I was working on weren't really challenging. And the interesting fun fact here is before I started learning Houdini and I was more transitioning into the world of visual effects, before that happened, I was not technical at all. I was probably the least technical person on a spectrum of 100 people that you can see. I was always failing. In, I was failing in mathematics class. I was terrible at stuff like physics and chemistry. And I was happy being a generalist, just doing really simple stuff. But then at some point I started, I remember I started um, doing a tutorial from 3dbus.com. I don't even know if they still exist, but back then they were one of the only places where you could go and get some tutorial content. Because back in the day, the content was really scarce. There was nothing out there that would teach you how to do amazing destruction or fire or tornadoes, nothing. So I had to learn really the real bare basics with Houdini 8, which back then looked, if you would look at Houdini 8 now, you would probably think that's the worst interface you've ever seen. And so basically I started doing that and, and I learned I, how to write very simple H script expressions, like how to do a sine wave on a box that then would, you know, move a little bit back and forth. And that to me was mind blowing because I, for the first time in my life, I could, I could see how mathematics are actually applied in real world, how they have a use case. When I was in school, nobody ever taught me 
what I would use mathematics for. They always, I saw always elliptical curves and logarithms, and I had no idea what to use them for. And then when I opened Houdini, suddenly I was like, oh, so I should have probably paid more attention in school back then. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I love that you bring that up because I, I hear people say sometimes that to be a technical artist, they're like, well, I don't know math, I'm not technical, I don't know science. But the thing is, becoming a technical artist really teaches you the uses of those things and it shows you really what you can do with that and it starts to sort of make sense in terms of art, which is sort of what I think is so powerful about it. You can, like You understand the uses of these things. Yeah, and not only that, once you actually dive inside the world of Houdini, it is also fun to explore what type of things you can do. And even more, sometimes when you do an effect, sometimes it is actually required to know a little bit about mathematics. Well, maybe it's not required, but it's um, definitely desirable if you know some fundamentals, for example, vector mathematics or trigonometry is very helpful because suddenly you can do things that you wouldn't be able to do if, you, or you would have to find a really hard work around in order to get to your goal but if you do know a little bit of those fundamentals of mathematics you can actually you know take the straight line to, uh, to your goal rather than having to go uh, um, through like hoops and obstacles in order to hit your target basically so it definitely helps but it's it's not a hundred percent required I've, I've seen the most amazing artists that work in houdini that uh, that don't use mathematics or they don't do programming, but they can still create amazing, amazing images. And that's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I think and we have, a, we have a question here in the chat room. Uh, so Ganesh is asking, can Houdini be integrated with UE4, so Unreal Engine 4? And um, that's a great question. And uh, the answer is yes. There's a whole thing called Houdini Engine, which is kind of a external port of Houdini that you can import into other software packages such as uh, Unreal Engine or Unity or Maya, you name it. Um, Houdini Engine is basically an interface in which you can use OTLs or digital assets that you create in Houdini and then you can apply them to whatever you do in your other software package. So there is definitely ways of, uh, of integration here. Yeah, um, Houdini is just so powerful. I think, and that's something that you know people begin to understand once they teach a course. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but also, what I was really thinking of, Manuel, is so you you went to school and then you really studied effects on the side. When you started to work in the effects industry, is there any really job that stuck out to you that's like the job that really pushed you to make your effects really go beyond and really got you sort of into that mindset and down your direction towards becoming a lead eventually? Uh, are you talking more broadly uh, when I was already working in the industry or are you talking about when I was personally learning Houdini or effects in general on the side before I ventured into the, the world of feature film? I mean, so right when you started to learn effects and then you, so when you switched from becoming more of a general artist over to an effects artist, what job was that that really made you make that official jump from no longer being a generalist and now it's full on effects. Okay, gotcha. So basically the way that works is um, I was I was working happily as a as a generalist uh, doing those motion graphic jobs and I always felt there was some, something missing. And so um, I learned about uh, that there are many visual effects conferences that you can attend. For example, the, the most uh, known one worldwide is SIGGRAPH, which is taking place in Vancouver this year, for example. Oh, nice. But in, in, in Germany, we have an equivalent, and it, uh, that's called the FMX. And FMX is pretty big in Europe. I think it's the biggest one in Europe. And so you have all those studios from all around the world. They are basically coming to, uh, visual, uh, to FMX, and they are presenting themselves. They're recruiting talent. They are showcasing different projects or movies and they show breakdowns, uh, very detailed stuff. And so I was attending one of those conferences because the, one of the company that I was freelancing for, they offered me a free ticket. And so I took the chance, I went to Stuttgart that time. I think that was the first time was rough. I think that must have been 2008. And so I went to Stuttgart and I I saw all of those talks and all those of those lectures about big companies such as Double Negative or um, I, I can't remember f uh, who else was there, but there were so many companies and they were all showcasing their stuff. And I was like, I need to do that. I need to get there. And so once I learned about 
I, and by that time, I didn't even know about very specific tools uh, such as uh, thinking particles. Houdini wasn't even a big thing back then. It was just kind of about to become um, recognized in the industry, but it wasn't by no means Houdini back then was a industry standard, um, which it is right now. If you ask any effects artist these days, what software package should I use? Everybody's gonna say Houdini because Maya is outdated and it's Autodesk. 3ds Max is pretty outdated and it's more focusing on stuff like architecture, visualization. You get Cinema 4D, which is kind of the use case for quick motion graphics or maybe also architecture. But Houdini is really the tool that immediately everybody will say that's for effects. And so when I was when I was at that conference of FMX, I told myself, you need to learn that and then you need to create a portfolio in order to you know, apply to big studios in order for me to also work on those big blockbuster movies. And so I, what I basically did is I, I went back home to, to my place in Munich and I started looking up those uh, softwares that I learned about, such as Houdini and Thinking Particles, and back then also Fume Effects, and I started to mess around with those. And mind you, back then, there was hardly any tutorials out there, um, as I already mentioned. So it was really tough. But I was actually fortunate, in, uh, fortunate enough to know one guy who was already in the industry. I kind of met him online. Uh, his name is Goran Pavlis. And Goran Pavlis is actually now my partner at Stormborn Studios because we became friends back then. And the friendship lasted all the way until now. And uh, he was kind of uh, kind enough uh, helping me out. Back then he was in LA, he was working for Uncharted Territory on 2012, Roland Emmerich's FX massive blockbuster movie. And so wow. he taught me he taught me out of his own free will how to use uh, Thinking Particles. And lo and behold, I really, you know, bunkered down and started learning all of those uh, intricate um, ways of creating destruction back then. And I spent roughly one year of creating a portfolio and then uh, I don't know, I was already sitting in a plane to Vancouver and <laughs> I got hired by Prime Focus for my first feature film. Wow. But basically back then it wasn't as hard getting a job in the industry as an effects person as it is now. Because now you have all those, the thousands of free tutorials online and the competition just basically um, went up exponentially because you got tons of visual effects schools, you got the visual effects workshops, you got the tutorials. There's so much that people can take advantage of in order to, you know, learn effects. So you also you have more competition. So it's of the utmost important that if you want to enter the industry as an effects artist or a technical director, that you excel and that you exceed other people's um, portfolio because every other student is basically your competition. So you have to think of ways that you can overcome or not overcome, but basically match their skills or even exceed them basically. Definitely. Um, and then I like what you were saying too about how you you made friends with um, your now co-founder. And I still want to talk about your your shift from being an FX artist to becoming an FX lead and sort of what that meant for you. Because I see a lead position very similar to a teacher, which is what you're doing now. And sort of what was your your mind shift once you became an FX lead? Are you more focused now on how to help people improve, how to build up on stuff? Oh, so basically right now my position is not really FX lead anymore because I'm the owner of a studio. So yeah. I, st I, I basically now I do everything. I, do st I still do shots. I do Houdini on a very regular basis, but I also do a lot of, you know, client interaction. I do all the stuff that is um, necessary to run a studio. But when I was an FX lead before founding Stormborn Studios, yeah. um, the, the biggest change is really how you behave and how you interact in your work environment because as an effects artist you're basically best friends with your own workstation and your task is to complete shots that uh, have been given to you by production may my, may it be your coordinator or your supervisor or your lead and when you become a lead you have to still you, you're still going to use Houdini you're still going to work on shots but you have to start being more humane in a way you have to start interacting with people much more because you're suddenly the team leader so you have a, a team of people that you have to interact with and the biggest challenge is everybody has a different personality and you got to make everybody happy as the lead so you have to you know you have to sometimes babysit people sometimes you have to 
um, look for strengths and weaknesses in people and pick the ones uh, where they exceed or where they show strength and then make use of their talent. Basically, sometimes you have a team of, um, it's, it might be a mixed bag of, uh, of talent and you have, you have to manage which person is going to do which tasks the most efficient. And that is really tough, actually. Yeah, I'd imagine. And I really like how you're saying about how what you do is you find where people's strengths are and sort of how to bring it out of them. I think that's such a great trait now that you're a teacher at CGMA too, because in your students, you sort of have that eye to figure where are their strengths? How can I help them improve? Including like sort of added onto your original outline for your class. So you can do the basics and then see where are my students exceeding? Where can I help push them? I think that's a really great trait for you to have that you found when you were elite, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. And by the way, I see a few questions in the chat room. I would say we're gonna probably address them after. We're gonna open the, the chat up for questions. So just keep mm -hmm. typing them, guys. And later on, I'm gonna uh, we're gonna discuss as much as possible. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Manuel. Everyone, just keep the the messages coming in chat. And then when we get to our Q and A session, which will be in about 30ish minutes, um, I'll come back to the chat, go over them, and then Manuel, you'll be able to answer them, right? Of course. Awesome. Um, well, as, lo then, as long as I, as, as long as I'm able to answer them. <laughs> of course. Um, and now I want to talk a bit more about sort of the artistic side and making things in Houdini with your effects. And I was wondering, so when people hear technical director and they sort of think more technical sides, so what would you say is the balance between your artistic influences, like what you see in the real world, and the technical side, the math of it, the cosines, the the ways, how do you balance that as a technical artist? Okay, so basically there are two types of person or uh, two types of groups in visual effects. You have the artists, no, let's say three actually. You got the artists that are purely artists. They can also sometimes be referred, uh, referred to as button pushers. Hmm. Um, <laughs> no offense, obviously. Um, hmm. Then there's, there, there's the mid ground of people that are very artistic, but they have some sort of technical um, knowledge or background, and then you've got the extreme sides, which is the pure technical director type of um, person who is very, very strong at computer science, at coding, at mathematics and algorithms. And I guess your question was, um, can you repeat your question? <laughs> I think um, I... All good. Um, I was wondering, where do you see the balance of it for you personally? And then I'm sure it changes depending on what job you're working, the company you're working. But where do you see the balance between your artistic influences, things you see in the real world, forms, like you were talking about earlier when you originally went to college, forms, you know, um, yeah, rule yeah. of thirds, things like that, and then the technical side, which you started to learn later on. Okay, so basically, it always comes down to producing something that is very pleasant to the eye, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever we create an effect, we want to create something that looks amazing. Sometimes it might be very realistically looking. Sometimes it might be a little bit more abstract or like cartoony or, you know, an animated sort of effect. But it is always of the utmost important that an effects artist has a good eye for detail and knows about things like composition and how things really behave in the real world. For example, if you make a building collapse and you have debris falling down onto the ground, you need to do. You need not only to drive the whole simulation from the technical aspect, but you also need to, you know, you need you need to know what's what does gravity feel like? Is this thing falling too fast or is it falling too slowly? Right? And then mm -hmm. you have uh, you have things where you sometimes need to be able to create a nice composition. That's why I mentioned the golden ratio earlier, because yeah. you can't just have an effect on the left side of the screen and on the right side, there's nothing else, right? You have, you have to kind of create a composition that fits into the image and, and kind of uh, reaches the expectation from your production. May it be the director or your supervisor. So, and then, so that's the artistic side of things. And the technical side of things is basically problem solving. Whenever you deal with Houdini, you, and you're not a button pusher, but your button pushers are basically junior artists. Yeah. And uh, and when I say the term button pusher, it's not at the least uh, meant in a derogative way. It is um, basically you you come into a company, you're pretty fresh. You you just maybe finished school, you graduated, you have some really good knowledge of Houdini, but you have to prove yourself first. And so 
at first your lead or your senior technical directors they will probably create some digital assets or OTLs and then you have to take those assets and you have to create effects with them so and that's why I'm saying button pusher because you normally take a digital asset and then you start manipulating it and you you basically have your artistic freedom in order to create the effect but you wouldn't be too much involved in the in the in the actual building of the asset because that's very very technical uh, creating digital assets requires sometimes python knowledge or advanced otl or digital asset building knowledge and that's those are skills that you will require over time and obviously if you are a very dedicated student you might already know how to do these things and then you can just prove yourself hopefully and then um, get promoted pr pretty quickly or somebody realizes your talent and uh, then they will take advantage of that and uh, will give you harder tasks because they know that you're capable of that uh, mm -hmm. it is always in effects it is always a matter of how you personally display yourselves to your surroundings if you have a positive hard-working attitude people will obviously um, appreciate that rather if you're if you're just an introvert, you're always, you know, cowered down in front of your computer, you're not talking to anybody, you're not showing your strength, then it might take longer. It's always, how do you present yourself as an individual? But coming to the technical side, the more you progress in Houdini and the more you wanna boost your career, if you wanna, starting from junior, if you want to become a mid-level artist or a senior artist, or even later on a lead or a supervisor, most of the times those positions require a solid foundation of skills and those are the technical skills we're talking here about vex scripting which by the way in the cg workshop we're going to talk a lot about vex scripting because it's kind of industry standard from manipulation of geometry in houdini now then we have python scripting and otl creation and then we have um the the all overall knowledge of houdini you know are you proficient to comfortably generate an explosion within a, an explosion within a few days? If you give an explosion without any um, without any setup to a junior artist, you would probably either you are super lucky and you have the most amazingly talented artist, but he will probably take still two weeks uh, to do the explosion, and then it might still not look perfectly realistic. But then you have the senior artists that have done maybe ten explosions already. They will just whip the explosion up and after a day or two they have the first good looking preview so obviously that's a lot of experience that comes into play here the more experienced you are the more you have done certain types of effects the more profession uh, proficient you will become at those right so yeah. it, it is uh, it is a journey as the artist you start small and then you build up your skill set and over time you progress you get respected by your uh, by your team and then people will quite naturally you know talk good things about you word of mouth will spread you will get uh, you will get job offers from other big studios and you suddenly get hired by another studio and you you jump in position you're no longer a junior artist maybe now you're a mid-level artist and then you'll get a pay raise but now there's more uh, people expect more from you there are more higher expectations so you have to just keep learning it's a constant development I myself I've been using Houdini since early 2009 and I'm learning every day is there's no stopping to it especially because there's new versions of Houdini being released every year and there's new features coming out so you have to really be able to learn and to be happy to learn new stuff because if you enter this industry learning is a thing that will always accompany you in your journey yeah um, that was a really great breakdown Manuel. and there's two things there that you said that I really loved. I love how you said, um, pretty emphasis sort of on in the industry, some things I don't think people get is they're like, oh, it's just about being on the computer, knowing what to do on the computer, but it really is sort of about knowing people, interacting with people. And then to the second point, doing that interacting with people, it helps you learn, it helps you grow. And that's really what it is, really like work in the industry is about learning every day, understanding things, trying to grow your own understanding. Um, oh, I think oh totally. Totally. Yeah, and, and, and the good thing is, the good thing is, if you are willing to, you know, get out of your own skin and approach other people and become friends with other people that have the same interests as you, such as other students that try to learn Houdini, then suddenly you realize that in Houdini, you can get to a certain goal with many different ways or workflows. 
So mm -hmm. if I create an explosion, I might have my own workflow and then the other artists might have a completely different workflow that gets to a very similar result. And those workflows can be either completely artistic or completely technical um, based on mathematics or algorithms or scripting, or it is just very artistic driven by very visual things in the viewport, for example. And so it's very important that you find people that have like-minded uh, interests because then you'll find that you can learn from their approaches because there, when I say there is many, there are many approaches, there are good and there are bad approaches as well. Some yeah. approaches are very efficient and get you to your goal very quickly. Other approaches will probably make your computer run out of RAM and crash everything. Um, or, it, or, or it will take 10 times as long. So it is very important yeah. that you have an open mind and you don't say my effect is the best effect. What I always want to see is how do other people approach the same effect so I can learn and I can see their perspective because everybody has a different perspective and the technical backgrounds are very vastly different in Houdini when I, when I see different artists in the industry. Yeah, um, and then speak more about workflow because you're talking about sort of how everyone has a different workflow. Uh, I was learning for your workflow, we, before you start an effect, I'm sure it depends on the studio and what you're working on, but you like to gather your references for it and sort of plan everything out, or you just want to jump on in. And I'm sure it depends too, because since you're a senior, I've been in Houdini for a lot longer, you might just be comfortable jumping in. But do you feel it's good to get reference before you work on an effect? Even, even being a senior now, I always, one of the first things I do is I go online and I search for references. You know, just now I had, for example, I had to grow a tree in Houdini from a baby tree all the way to a fully grown tree with cherry blossoms on it. And cool. obviously there's not going to be a time lapse that you can find reference for, but you can see what have other people done in CGI? What have other Houdini users or Maya users? How do their trees look? That's the first thing that I look at. And then I see how their trees evolve and I can see what are the good things, what are the bad things about those, uh, about the work that other people did. Or when you create something like, let's say, a collapsing brick tower. We're in my in my workshop introduction to uh, to effects using Houdini. We're making a massive brick tower collapse. So mm -hmm. the first thing that I show my students is uh, and look at some references of some similar structures collapsing. So you get a feel of um, the gravity. You get a feel of the interaction of the brick materials. You know what forces are interacting such as wind and turbulence and then you see the detail that gets generated when bricks grind against each other and they you know they create this sort of dust and all of that uh, reference is always very important because you can't just come up with something and I mean, obviously you could just come up with something, but you wanna be able to sell it to your lead or to your supervisor or even the director. And only by um, you know, having a look at reference, you can make sure that your effect is looking realistic because at the essence, we always try to make something that looks as real as possible. Even if it's some magical effect, the magical effect still needs to have really, really nice detail and it needs to be high quality and it needs to look like something that the audience could imagine at possibly being real. And that's the difficult part. And so, yeah, whenever I have to approach a certain effect, I will immediately go online and look at reference because that's the guidance for me um, where I want to get, basically. Yeah, and I think that's a great thing to bring up reference because I think all artistic disciplines need that. And it's a sign that I think students really need to understand too, that reference really is where you're coming from. Everything comes from nature. Everything comes from reference. And then I like how you're talking about too, how there are so many different things you can do in Houdini. It just blows my mind. How you can build a tree. You can make procedural buildings. You can make explosions. You can make flip fluid. And I was wondering for you personally, Manuel, do you have any effects you enjoy the most visually that you really like to make? And when you finish it, you sit back and like, that's like your favorite effect, like electricity, water, explosions. What do you like? Well, that's a tough question because <laughs> I used to be amazed by volumetrics, which is smoke, explosions, yeah. and, the, and the likes and volumes such as clouds. And I used to do those for a bunch of years. I was always the volumetric guy. Whenever I used to work on something, they always threw the smoke stuff at me. So 
I I really was amazed on the the real of the intricate intricacies of creating explosions and really mastering Houdini pyro, like the solver, even being able to break open the solver and then um, even sometimes manipulating it to an extent that it's not really the full solver uh, that's uh, in play, but also your own stuff that's kind of interacting with that. And so for me, um, pyro in Houdini was for the longest time the most interesting part because it is really, really challenging to create amazing explosions. And it's also, there's so many tricks that you can learn in order to speed up your workflow. So it took me definitely a, a bunch of years to master that part of Houdini. But now I'm uh, kind of in the middle of, um, you know, appreciating other things too, which I still have done in the past, but I haven't really been able to focus as much on that, such as rigid body destructions or even flip fluids or particles. But um, for me, it really doesn't matter what what type of effect I do nowadays. It has to be challenging. You know, if I can't, if my mind is not engaged when doing an effect, I'll probably get bored. But if it's something that I haven't done so far, such as growing a tree, then I will still get the same enthusiasm that I had nine years ago, and I will still enjoy my work quite a bit. Yeah, and I love how you keep, how you brought it back against the idea of you know challenging yourself, pushing your understanding of what you know to really grow as an artist. Um, I personally too, explosions is just awesome. Um, I love trying out smoke when I had the chance to be. Um, yeah, it's it's great to know sort of your thoughts on that and sort of about growing and really challenging yourself and how as an artist we're always going to change sort of what we like so our goal should always be sort of to improve ourselves because we're always going to like something else so if you understand how to improve that's really where you can keep growing as an artist i feel um and so oh, totally yeah <clears throat> getting closer to talking about your class i was curious for you are you pretty much all Houdini now? Because Houdini is so strong, you can make procedural stuff, or do you sometimes still go into other packages? I usually just stay in Houdini these days. I mean, there's a question um, that was just asked in the forum if Redshift is uh, being used in Houdini. And mm -hmm. uh, Redshift, Redshift is a GPU accelerator, accelerated renderer. And um, we're using that at Storeborn Studios on a, a very frequent basis. So, um, Right now, if I look at all the tools that the industry offers, there's no real reason to go anywhere else but Houdini when it comes to creating effects. There is, you know, if I look at Maya, Maya integrated Nayad and they got Bifrost, but Maya, in my opinion, I could totally start cursing about Maya, but it, uh, it's like a very <laughs> friendly session here. So I'm keeping it yeah. short. Maya is not my tool of choice because it is very limited and it's, the structure that Maya has been built with is very, very outdated. It's uh, it's nothing that I would touch with a 10-foot pole. And the same goes for 3ds Max. 3ds Max has some amazing uh, plugins such as Thinking Particles and Fume Effects. But when it comes to having to buy a software, and that's where I have now new experience because I got my own studio. If I want to look at a software, and Houdini has it all. It's got its own render engine. It's got its own dynamics such as flip fluids, volumetrics, particles, procedural stuff. I don't have to buy any plugins in order to create any type of effect in Houdini. If I buy Maya or if I buy 3ds Max, I have to purchase a whole suite of plugins in order to be able to compete with Houdini. And not even then I can do that because like I said, the structure of the softwares themselves is too outdated. Houdini is completely node-based and completely non-destructive and procedural. And it is fast, it is reliable, and the company behind Houdini, which is side effects, they are much, much better when it comes to customer service than uh, Autodesk. Autodesk is terrible. You might find a bug in 3ds Max, submit it to Autodesk. They might not even fix it if they don't think it's a priority. At side effects... Uh, I, just, I, I was agreeing with you. I've had, I've had troubles. Did, you had troubles? With with Maya, I mean, so I, I totally agree with the with you on that, Manuel. Yeah, totally. And so yeah, the the team of side effects is just really, really behind the the, the user base. And there's even if you go to sites like the, there's a forum, I can uh, type the the name of the forum down here. It's called Oddforce. If you go to oddforce.net, there's a Houdini wish uh, wish list thread 
that gets updated every year, and people write in what they want to have as a feature in Houdini, and SideFX actually integrates some of those requests in their latest version of Houdini or their next release because they actually care about what the customer base is saying. And with Autodesk or other similar software packages, I don't see that. Yeah, um, I think that's great about Houdini. And also because I think it's great for students as well, because especially if you know you want to do effects, you don't have to worry about any of the programs. I do 3D modeling, and even now, I still have to worry about three or four programs. But for you, it's just Houdini, and then it can get everything done. And it's so integrated with the modeling, the nodes, the way it all works together. And I think that's great for students who, you know, they don't have to worry about purchasing a bunch of things, a bunch of plugins. They can just have their one plugin and just know it's going to work. Oh, did your mic drop out, Manuel? I can hear you type. Can you can you hear me talk? Yes, I can. I think it dropped out for like half a second earlier. Um, okay, no, because now. I've got I've got a my mute symbol is now red with a with a dot animating over it. But if you can hear me, that's fine. Well, huh, strange. Um, maybe it's. Huh. But yeah, um, it should be fine now. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right, sorry uh, for the interruption, guys. Oh, no problem, Manuel. Um, but then uh, getting even closer what your class is going to be about. I'd like to hear, sort of, since you've been a lead artist and a teacher last semester at CGMA, I'd love to hear about the most successful traits that you see in your students and sort of what you've learned from them that other students should be taking note of. Like, what can they do to make sure they're ahead of the curve? OK, so when we specifically talk about my Houdini workshop, Introduction to Effects Using Houdini, the yep. biggest thing I learned about my students is that if you don't really work your ass off, then it's going to be troublesome for you. <laughs> and that might be, a, that's actually a really good thing because um, I don't know if you guys saw my teaser that I recently published for my for my workshop, but I recorded 33 hours of challenging Houdini content. And we start with uh, very simple things and we move all the way to very complex, intricate setups. And if you don't really have the desire to learn things and you're not willing to spend 15 to 20 hours per week on learning Houdini, then the course might not really be for you because I try to make my course very, very similar to a production environment. And when I say production environment, I'm saying um, imagine yourself working as an effects artist for a big studio such as ILM or Weather Digital or Sony Image, uh, Sony Pictures Image Works. What I made with my course, I made sure that most of the projects that we're uh, that we're gonna do in my course, they are um, they're working in conjunction. So, for example, we are in the in the second week, we're modeling a riverbed, and then in week eight and nine, we're gonna populate that riverbed with a river simulation with flip fluids, and then we're gonna simulate some white water. But basically, if you guys don't have that that really that motivation and that perseverance to learn Houdini in a way that you're willing to spend your weekend with Houdini rather than maybe, you know, going to Disneyland or some shit, <laughs> then, you know, um, the course might not be for you because there's there's many, there's thousands of free tutorials out there that you can just look at for free without paying and you can get to a certain level in Houdini. But what I do in my course is I teach stuff that won't that other people won't teach because I'm not afraid of going technical. I will, like, don't be afraid of uh, scripting or programming. We start with a few very simple VEX snippets, for example, in order to manipulate some geometry. And at some point, we're going to write big, big VEX code. Um, and I will show you guys how to achieve that from start to finish. But if you don't personally have the desire to really learn Houdini, spend lots of hours per week getting uh, behind the, you know, the core of the tutorials and also doing your assignments. There's going to be assignments every week. If you don't think uh, that you can spend much time um, per week with Houdini, like I said, the workshop might not be for you. But if you want to learn, if you want to become an amazing artist, then you should definitely you know, consider um, taking part of this journey because I spent roughly seven months of my free time last year creating the content and Actually, CGMA told me, you know, do one and a half hours per week. 
it ended up being three hours to four hours of video for me for every single week because I had just so much to talk about and I felt I felt guilty if I wouldn't mention a few things here and there. And so my content became much bigger than what you would normally get in um, similar workshops or similar tutorials. And that's because I'm at heart a perfectionist. I always mm -hmm. want to make sure that uh, that I what I what I teach people that they really they don't just you know get an idea of things, but they they really know at the at the bottom of their heart what to do when they face a problem next time. And so I teach in my in my workshop very deeply and heavily how to become a problem solver, which is something that most tutorials won't teach you. Most tutorials show you from A to Z how to create an effect. What they don't show you is what happens if you run into a problem. Because if you work as an artist in a studio, you have a team that you can obviously rely on when it comes to problem solving. But as an artist, you should be able to tackle a certain amount of problems yourself without you know, asking other people for help. That is becoming independent in Houdini or becoming independent as an artist. And that was my biggest goal. I want to, I want to be able to say that at the, at the end of my workshop, when the nine weeks have passed, that my students learned how to be problem solvers, how they can debug their own problems mm -hmm. without having to rely on every, anybody else. Because that's such an important skill to have, especially when you're new in the industry and you want to get a job as a junior artist. If you're just used to making tutorials, or, or sorry, if you're used to just watching tutorials, then people won't take you seriously. Because only if you have tried to work in a sort of production environment, then you will realize how tough it can be to be an effects artist. I kind of went on a little monologue rant here. Um, but I hope I I hope I get the message through. <laughs> no, that was great, Manuel. Um, and it really shows how you have such a great traits to be a teacher because you're just so passionate about it that you put in your all. You spent your free time doing this and showing that to your students how you're so passionate, how you put in the extra mile. Really should be showing them that they do have to put in the extra mile if they want to be there, you know. And that's not just for Houdini. It's not just for effects. I think all artists should know that it's not like there's not an easy path to art. If you want to do it, you got to do it hard. And it's great that you're going to be teaching this and that you're so passionate about it, too, because you're going to be putting your all into it. Um, and then something else that I'd like to talk about for your class, Intro to FX um, for Houdini, is so you're talking about problem solving. Students will be able to talk to you live, correct, and be able to question about problems. And you'll be able to explain to them sort of how they can go about problem solving, it, correct? Oh yeah. So basically, and before we get into that, I wanted to mention one last thing. Obviously, guys, there's a lot of students that um, that come to my workshop that don't have as much time to dedicate because they're maybe working as an uh, as an artist in their in their uh, sorry they they have a full time job basically and they do it in the evenings or in, on the weekends. In that case, obviously, feel free to stop by any anyway because you guys can actually download the video lectures and you can. You know, watch them anytime you want. What I meant with uh, being dedicated towards the workshop is if you want to pursue the assignments uh, that are part of the workshop. So every, yeah. every single week we have an assignment. For example, in week number one, there's a, there's a procedural challenge where I tell you guys, with all the techniques we learned, build something very creative. It is almost up to you what you create. And then I kind of judge from the assignment submissions I get from my students what the skill level of everybody's um, of everybody is in the class. And then in, let's say in week number four, we create a lightning bolt particle system that our character shoots into the brick tower. And that's the assignment. So at the end of the week, every student has to do their assignment and hand it in so I can give notes on it. But basically, if you can't follow the assignments, you can still be part of the course and you can download the lectures and work at your own pace. But what I wanted to what I, what I, what I wanted to um, convey is that only if you do the assignments, you will run into those problems, and then I can help you live or in a forum or we have every single week we have a Q and A session in which for one hour we do a live back and forth where students can uh, ask me any question, and then I can work with you guys in order to overcome these obstacles. Because if you don't follow those assignments then you might not run into the problem until five weeks later. And then it's already almost too late because you're falling behind. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought that up too, Manuel, because I feel like some students, especially when starting out in like an intro class, they feel like if they go in, they hit a problem, they feel like they did something wrong. But that's really the whole goal of it, especially with the live interaction with you being able to talk to you. The goal is to get to those problems. So then, like you were saying earlier, you learn how to be a problem solver, which is pretty much what an FX artist is about, learning how to solve problems. And like you were saying, you really have to go along with the course to be able to hit those problems to ask questions of you, right? That is correct. And uh, so we have a few different ways of um, me answering questions. So first of all, we got the forum on the CGM, uh, CGMA website. So every week there's a, a different section of the form that is very dedicated towards that specific week and the assignment. For example, creating the brick tower or destroying the brick tower. And then students can ask specific questions um, for that specific assignment. And then once everybody hands in their assignment at the end of the week, I will actually spend my entire weekend uh, basically uh, recording a video for every individual student in which I open their Houdini scene files, I look for questions that uh, every student has, and I look at their work, I will give uh, artistic feedback, I will give technical feedback, I will answer questions, and if, if people have problems, I will help them to solve those problems in those videos. And then on, for me in my workshop, it is mostly every Monday night, we have a Q&A session, which is uh, basically uh, very similar to what we're doing right now, I'm mostly the one who's talking, and then we've got a chat room where a student can answer, uh, can ask me any question really, and then I will just open Houdini and we'll start, you know, dabbling around in order to create some effects that they are interested in, or just guide them through a bunch of problems that they have, which is, in my opinion, one of the most valuable things in terms of the course, because as a student, whenever do you have the chance to actually interact with somebody who has, I don't know, 10 years of industry experience and you know, can teach you some stuff that you might not be able to find online anywhere. And that's something that is a lot, I think that's something that people have to realize. If you can ask somebody who has been in the industry for such a long time, if you can ask them questions, then you're gonna learn much, much quicker than when you have to come up with solutions by yourself without any other help. Yeah, um, that's a great point, Manuel. And I think people really need to like understand the value of asking questions I mean, the fact that, for like you're saying, the past 10 years, I mean, you've been working on almost like, it seems like every single blockbuster, like summer blockbuster, like, you know what you're doing, you'll be able to help these people out. And that's just really what's great about the course. Um, and then winding down to get to the question phase, I was curious, I've seen questions before about this. How can students prepare before your class starts? Because it's not, you know, it's not like they'll know nothing from the beginning of your class, but what can they do to sort of get ready, get warmed up for your class? Oh, so what I usually recommend uh, in order to start my course is to get a general understanding of how Houdini works. So I don't, if you're a student who never opened Houdini at all, then that course might be too advanced for you because I don't spend time explaining the interface, nor do I really explain, well, I do explain some of the different contexts, but you should know in Houdini, you got these magic words such as SOPs. Um, I'm going to write a few of those down here. Uh, we've got SOPs, SHOPs, ROPs. We've got COPs. We've got VOPs and, and a bunch of other ones as well. So those are the very standard contexts. SOPs, for example, is surface operators. It's any procedural manipulation. Maybe you have a, um, what's a good example? Maybe you want to create a lawn full of grass, or you want to create a mountain landscape. That's where you would just, you know, start with a grid and then apply a noise to it, and then suddenly you got some mountain-like uh, geometry. You know, then you got shops where you create materials and shaders. You got ROPs, which are render operators. That's where you, you know, you create your mantra node and you render your image. And you got COPs, which is the compositing context. You got VOPs, which is, uh, uh, let's see, vector, op is it vector operators or vertex operators? I can't even remember. But um, it's the uh, context in which uh, you manipulate points or primitives on a very direct way, which is the sort of visual equivalent of writing VEX in Houdini for geometry manip manipulation. So I just want my students to have a general understanding of how these different contexts in Houdini interact with each other. 
you don't have to know how to specifically render something or you don't have to know how to create a mountain. That's totally out of the spectrum. But what I want you guys to know is how to deal with the viewport, how to navigate Houdini, how to you know create nodes. Maybe it's of advantage if you've written some H script expressions already, or maybe you tried some VEX scripting. That's obviously a plus, but in theory, you can start from scratch as long as you know these different things. Yeah, um, I think that's that's great. So people don't really have to know anything advanced, just the basics, have Houdini open, and people have time. I just put your, your class intro to FX using Houdini in the chat too, so people can check it out. It starts in July, correct? July. I think so. So the cur the current course is running until I think the end or the beginning of the Ju I think at the beginning of July, and then the the summer semester will start in early August, I believe. But I might be wrong here. But I think it's early August. Yeah. So people still they have time to prepare for this if they don't if they've never opened Houdini before. You guys have time, and then you can get started with manual. Um, okay. so that's oh yeah, and by the way, there's a, there's a great Vimeo channel called Go Procedural, and that is from Side Effects, uh, the company that makes Houdini themselves. I'm actually I'm gonna try to find the link right now. Yeah, awesome. And uh, in that channel, there's so many free tutorials by the makers of Houdini that you where you can just you know take a dive into some of the basics to get familiar with the software. And then obviously, if you just Go to YouTube or Vimeo and you Google Houdini tutorials. There's so much free stuff out there. I mean, uh, I can't mention that enough. Today, nowadays, education is basically for free online. You just have to have the will to pursue and uh, you know get into that sort of mindset of learning by yourself rather than having somebody else telling you to learn. That's really what I what I try to teach my my students in my workshop is if you are an autodidact, if you are you know, somebody who can learn by himself, you will learn much, much quicker than somebody who always needs to be told which steps to take in order to do something. If yeah. I have a student who is completely dedicated and who will ask questions, who will go the extra mile in order to make his effect especially awesome, and I've got the other student that does the bare minimum in order to, you know, proceed to the next week, then I always will tell the the later uh, the latter student, you know, just try a little harder because just by doing the bare minimum, you won't be able to compete in this industry. You gotta be ready to work. You gotta be ready to dedicate time and energy into becoming a effects artist. It's not gonna be no in this world. Nothing is for free. Basically, if you wanna become um, an artist in this industry, you gotta be willing to dedicate time and you know just really learn stuff. There's, you know, if you're used to your mom, you know, uh, washing your clothes and uh, mm -hmm. making your breakfast, yeah. that is not the mindset that you should uh, approach this workshop with. You got to be able to do your own laundry, basically. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love what you said there, Manny, about like, that was a great description of sort of the perfect student that these people should be trying to emulate, pushing the boundaries. And then with our last sort of 10 minutes here, um, I'm gonna go back to some of the questions that I saw earlier for our Q&A, if that's the right, Manuel. Oh yeah, uh, guys, when you are in the chat, I think if uh, if Martin thinks it's time to uh, to do to open the um, the chat room uh, to the floor, then please go ahead and ask us any question. We we'll see if there's a few questions. Um, I remember from earlier, Ganesh said, "I'm currently creating a realistic CGI film using Unreal 4." So my question is. Which one is much better to create VFX in your opinion, Houdini or Unreal 4? Okay, so this question was posed by Ganesh and it's kind of a double-edged sword because ideally Houdini is much, much more um, basically capable of creating really amazing effects. But the problem is that in Unreal, engine or any other game engine, you're very limited by the amount of polygons or by the amount of um, detail that you can display. So in my opinion, Houdini is still my tool of choice, but you need to change your world because you know, if you do, let's say a fire that has to be ported to Unreal uh, Engine, then you have to create, you have to approach it with a different workflow where, for example, 
we, we put rendered images on sprites or we use textures to display the fire in the viewport or we use live particles that have sprites attached to them. So Houdini is still the tool that I would use in order to create those effects, but you have to approach it a little differently. And in that, uh, in that channel that I just posted, which is Go Procedural on Vimeo, there's actually a lot of different um, lectures and talks and even tutorials about how to create certain effects for games. And like I said, it's not gonna be as straightforward as creating effects for feature film because in feature film, it doesn't matter how much topology we have on certain objects or how many millions of voxels we can uh, display because we're gonna render them. And for rendering, we can really, sometimes an image can render hours if I render water or I render a really difficult smoke simulation um, that's like full in your face. But so here we can, we can actually afford to spend hours on those effects when we are rendering them. But in Unreal, those effects need mostly to be, uh, you need to be able to display them in real time, for example. Maybe if you do a CGI film, you can pre-render stuff, but still you're gonna be a little bit limited. So to answer your question short, I would still use Houdini, but I would try to find a different workflow in order to be able to use Unreal Engine to the full maximum. Um, that was a great rundown sort of of the difference too between game effects and uh, film effects. While they are still very similar in the way they look, I think the technical aspects of how they're implemented is a little bit more complicated. But obviously your class will go over just effects in general and then how to implement it in different ways. And speaking of which, Emma says, do you cover how to render effects so that they work in Nuke or the or the light? Okay, Emma, that is actually a great question. So since I'm trying to put so many different contexts in my workshop, such as, you know, VEX coding, procedural modeling, we've got rigid body dynamics, we've got particles, we got volumetrics, we got flip fluids, and we got white water particle simulations. So there's so much content that I only had time for one week where we talk about rendering, shading, and lighting. One week might not sound like a lot, but like I said, I always have three to four hours of solid content. I don't, I don't really talk around about trivial things. I always r get right to the ground of things. So I will definitely talk um, a little bit about how to create render passes, but unfortunately I can't get fully into how to create AOVs or different like very complex render passes. I will create uh, for, for, the, for the, um, this brick tower that we're destroying, I will create render part passes for all the particles, for the volumetrics, for the geometry, such as the tower and the, the background and the ground. And then we got some sparks and they will all be rendered as different passes. And then we will take COPS, which is the compositing context in Houdini, in order to put these render passes together into one final comp composite. So. We don't use Nuke because I frankly just don't have a Nuke license and I want it to be my workshop to be about Houdini and not about Nuke. So I use the Houdini compositing context in order to put these images together for a final composite. But the concept is really the same. I mean, if you have a merge node in Nuke, you also have a merge node in, um, in uh, Houdini Cops where you can choose if you want to have the layer being additive or if you want to multiply it. So the the operations are very, very similar to Nuke. However, I just don't teach Nuke, I teach Houdini. And uh, I hope that, uh, let me know in the chat if that answers your question. Uh, that was a great rundown um, that you gave there again, Manuel. And I think for a lot of people too, utilizing effects in different environments, Unreal, Nuke, Emma said that was good. Uh, but I think, so what you're teaching really is the basics, like what you need to know, sort of like in, in sculpture, the forms, the ideas behind something. And then once the class is over, these more specific things, once you get the underlying idea that you'll be teaching from your class, it'll be so much easier to implement into new or Unreal. Is that correct? Not quite, because I am teaching the basics, but I'm also mm -hmm. always feeding my students some stuff that they really have to wrap their minds around. Because uh, like I said in the beginning, when I started out as an artist, I was completely artistic without any t technical background. And then 
and that's maybe something that's, uh, that I didn't really mention, but in the, in the last 10 years, my sort of mindset evolved to a way where now I'm always scripting things with either VEX or with Python. I always do crazy expressions and I do very technical things. And so I wanted my students to be also able to tackle things like that. And so we're starting with basic stuff every week. We're doing some very basic stuff, but then I also invite my students to really, you know, use their brains in order to do some concepts that not, are not as not as basic, but actually very complex and very challenging. And I know that the workshop is called Introduction to Who to Effects Using Houdini, but I would personally I would give it almost a different title. I would call it technical fast track course um, to master Houdini in nine weeks. Obviously, you're not going to master Houdini, but um, by the end of the workshop, you're going to have so much, you are going to have acquired so many skills that frankly, you wouldn't get in any other sort of introductory course that I know of, because I really want to transmit to my students that technical, being technical is very, very important when it comes to Houdini. And even if you're very artistic and you think that you never want to have to deal with code at all, I will teach you how to use code and I will actually force you to use code. And at the end, I actually had a bunch of students in the very first iteration of the workshop. They told me, you know, they were afraid of using code, but by the end they, they um, finished my workshop, they were comfortable using code and they actually had fun writing expressions and snippets. And that's something where I was, I, I, I really feel fulfilled because that showed me that I was able to, you know, in a playful way, teach my students how to do stuff that they were either afraid of or not comfortable with at all. And so my, my workshop is not super basic. It is a journey from, from the base, uh, basic stuff uh, to more advanced knowledge. Thanks for that, like telling us more about what your class is about. And I like how you said too about you know, getting students to really enjoy scripting and enjoy the technical side. And sort of how your class is more about that. Um, and I think that'd be great for students to know. I love when I learn something new that at first you're like not enjoying it, but then when you really start to understand the reason behind it, understand what it's good for, then you really start to enjoy these things. And I think students really, you know, have fun in your class, even if there's more technical side, you know? But you know, in the end, Houdini is a very technical software package. So why mm -hmm. not, you know, why not try to get the most out of it? You know, even even if you want to be completely artistic, that's fine. Like be my guest and be an artist, but sometimes you just need to have some sort of technical knowledge in order to achieve a certain effect. And if you have the technical tools, you can even be much more of an artist because you don't have to think too much on how you create the technical side of the effect, but then you can actually focus on the artistic direction for the uh, specific effect. Yeah, that's a really great way to explain, especially once you have a tool as powerful as Houdini, really push its limits and then like you're saying the artistic side almost becomes easier you know oh yeah oh yeah um is there any other questions in the chat coming through um Ganesh said my new crush Houdini <laughs> yeah that's good <laughs> glad to hear that uh, Ganesh yeah guys just shoot away we've got time if you have some mm -hmm. questions I'd be happy to answer them now is the time. Or if you guys join the workshop, you can ask me as many questions as you want. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I um, I dropped your um, your workshop in the chat. I can drop it again too in case anyone missed it. There we go. FX. But really, more about the mastery because you put in so much effort into this course and you really went above and beyond. It sounds like man, you really put so much info from the very basics all the way to, like you're talking about scripting nodes, writing your own scripts, and those are things that are gonna be really valuable for students who wanna get into the industry, especially on the technical side of it. Yeah, like, like, as, like I mentioned before, if you're trying to get into the industry, you're gonna have a lot of competition. There are literally hundreds of students um, hitting the market every, every single year, right? Because we have like, alone in Vancouver, in, in Canada here, I think we've got five or six or more visual effects schools. And if you extrapolate that all over the, all over the place in the world to other countries, then you really, really have a lot of competition. So only if you, you know, go the extra mile and put a lot of effort into 
you know, being able to compete with those students, then you can get a job in the industry. And what I always say, guys, if, if you want to get an idea, um, what is sort of expected when it comes to, you know, creating a demo reel or a portfolio to apply to companies, go to vimeo.com and just type in Houdini student reel. I just type vimeo.com here in the chat. So type in Houdini student reel and then sort the results by, I don't know, by popularity or something. And then have a look at what those students create. And you'll probably, be, your mind is gonna be blown because some students really deliver amazing, amazing shots in their portfolios. And you wanna be able to complete with that, uh, compete with that. And that will require quite a bit of effort on your side. Because like I said, in the world, nothing is for free. If you wanna excel at any sort of skill, you have to put in your own personal time and dedication in order to achieve that. But it's totally possible, you know? I made it with being the most artistic person that really, I loathe maths when I was a kid. I, whenever somebody told me I, I have to do something that's related to mathematics, I would probably turn around and run away. But now mathematics are a tool that I use in order to create my effects or scripting is a tool that I use in order to achieve a certain effect. Yeah, and thanks for, I, like you said, you really sort of have to compare yourself to the other students that are really at the top of the league because you're not competing just with the students that you see around you. You're really competing with the students that are at the top of their game because those are the ones that are gonna be getting into the studio. So you have to be, like you were saying before, at or above their level. So it's a good idea to sort of get an idea of where other students are at. Um, also, Iraq put a question um, saying, looking at the way a director like Neil Bloomkamp used Unity to make the film Adam, do you think Houdini could be used as a major part of a pipeline like that, or it be mainly Unity still? Oh, that's a good question. I'm actually equipped to answer that question because my two co-workers, Goran Pavlis and Alex Lombardi, they both worked together with Neil Blomkamp on that specific movie. They actually wow. used to work at their at his studio called Oats before they joined me at Stormborn Studios. So and cool. um, yeah, it's really exciting. So they, so for example, Goran was actually involved in Adam and they used Houdini in order to port the effects into, uh, uh, into Unity. And um, you can definitely create a pipeline around Unity and Houdini in order to in order to achieve your goals. And, and um, what I told uh, to Ganesh earlier about you know how to how you have to change your workflow because suddenly you're dealing with a game engine, that's mm -hmm. that still applies. You just have to structure your OTLs differently. You have to you know um, you use game engine. Uh, you use uh, the Houdini engine uh, in order to bring that into into Unity, and then you can do a lot of things. But you just have to structure your effects a little bit different than when you would uh, create effects for feature film. Because like I said, in, in feature film, we don't have limitations to how many polygons we can render in theory. In uh, games, it is different. You have a limit in order to make your game still being um, at the frame rate that it's supposed to be at, right? Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about those limitations. So for example, if I create a, an explosion in Houdini, my explosion could be on disk, just the, 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 the amount of disk space that it takes. It could be, you know, a few hundred gigabytes, right? And wow. then I render, the, I, I render that and one frame could in theory take one or two hours depending on the render quality. When you're working with games, you don't have the you don't have the luxury to import an explosion that is several hundred gigabytes big, right? So you have to think of other ways of how to ex how to display that explosion in your in your three D environment in the game in order to make it still look good or uh, still look fantastic. That's obviously the desired thing, and um, and still have that frame rate in order to play the game fluently without any lag. And that's the difficulty. And that applies to particle effects. It applies to destruction effects, such as rigid body dynamics or soft body dynamics. It, uh, it applies to magical effects, uh, you name it. Basically, you have to work with different workflows. I mentioned sprites in the past. A lot of the times game uh, game artists or game technical artists, they, they create effects in Houdini, then they render them onto little cards, and then those cards are being put onto particles in the game engine, and they create a sort of, illusion that there is something 
that is, for example, burning when talking about a fire, or that there's something, you know, smoking. Like if you have like a big smokestack in the in the back of the of the game, burn uh, like you know, smoking away. It's just there's tons of limitation when it comes to games, just because you can really create complex geometry really quickly in Houdini. That is too. Um, that is just too cumbersome for a game to digest, basically. So you have to, you have to, be very mindful about that and create your effects in a way that they are, they have a low polygon count, that they can be fluently um, displayed in your game engine or in real time, depending what you want to do. And that's certainly all possible, but it just requires a little bit of a different approach when creating those effects. Yeah, that was a, a great breakdown, um, Manuel. I do some some work in games too, and what you said too is right. It's it's mainly going to be sort of rendering in Houdini, and then sort of putting those onto cards, and then really what you're talking about earlier, problem solving. How can I make this the most efficient in the game so it still looks nice without crashing the game? Exactly. Yeah, because you don't want to play the game, and then suddenly the game tries to load this. 400 gigabytes explosion, and then suddenly you can't move around in your game anymore because you're it's busy loading. I mean, you all guys, you know that when you open a game, in the beginning, there's always a big, you know, you've got a screen, and in the background, things are loading. And that takes usually a minute or so. For example, if you're on the PlayStation, it takes a minute, and then suddenly you're in your level, and you can uh, start playing, right? But yeah. That is only possible because the game preloads certain things, so you can then enter the game or the 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 um, digital world of the game, and then you can walk around and interact with it. And that's only possible because um, things are being preloaded. Now, when it comes to effects in a game, like I said, most of the times you see effects being put on a card and they kind of displaying like that, and they give you the illusion of an effect. But if you were tr if you tried to load a real fire that is has been created into Houdini uh, that has been created in Houdini. You, if you try to load that high resolution fire into the game, then suddenly your game would have to try to load that on every single frame, right? And the frame yeah. sometimes can be 40, 40 frames per second, I think, or even more. Sometimes you have sixty yeah. frames per second. And if you try to load any high res geometry, such a such as a volume or a very high polygon count. Um, stuff like, uh, let's say, flip fluids, then that wouldn't be possible in the game anymore without having a lag. So you have yeah. to be very mindful. But like I said, guys, go to the pre Go procedural website on Vimeo and have a look at a bunch of those uh, lectures about how to create effects for games. They got some really good stuff on that website. Yeah, um, I think that you put that up a bit earlier, right, Manuel? Yeah, I can post it again. Like, uh, uh, yeah. And then, so I, I think um, if anyone else has one or two more questions that we could get and then sort of wrap up. So does anyone else have any extra questions for Manuel? Yeah, guys, don't be shy. <laughs> I don't know if some people already tuned out. I mean, it's 7 p.m. here in Vancouver. And if you guys are from different time zones in the world, yeah. Um, yeah. if you guys are from Europe, then it's probably in the middle of the night for you. So I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. some people are super sleepy by now. 7 a.m. for Ganesh. 7 wow. a.m. Well, props to you, Ganesh, to making it. Uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a good dedication right here. Emma, 11.30 a.m. in Australia. Yum, Yumi, 4 a.m. Um, wow! Well, oh, you you guys you guys are really uh, really hardcore, especially yeah. you me. <laughs> uh, so no more questions for anyone else. Anything else you want to ask, Manuel? Let's see. Um, oh, we, we see Arak here. Yeah. Is there a specialist area of FX that would be good to focus on, such as fire, liquids, or a particular type of particle approach that would be wanted? Okay, so what I can tell you right away, Arak, is that when you start working as a, let's say you get your first job in the industry, or you want to get your first job in the industry as a junior artist, for example, working for one of the biggest studios, such as, I don't know, Double Negative or Method Studios or maybe ILM. So what they're going to look for is uh, effects that you typically see in movies. And when I say movies, I mean, obviously, 
effects, uh, visual effects heavy movies, such as Transformers or any of the Avenger films, any Marvel superhero movie. In those movies, we usually see always the type of effect that will we will see it for the next 20 years in every single movie, most likely, where you have something being destroyed. May, might it be a car that's being destroyed or it's a spaceship that hits a, a building. So any destruction type of effect will be always really, really um, well recognized by recruiters. On top of that, any water effects, water effect artists are very hard to come by because water is a very diff difficult discipline. So if you are able to create a cool shot of, um, you know, having a ship dr uh, driving through a stormy ocean, that's something that recruiters will definitely look at. Or, you know, put a house on fire or, um, you know, look at your favorite magic movie and uh, I don't know, The Sorcerer's Apprentice or some stuff like that. Or I don't know, there's so many, right? So look at your favorite effects and try to recreate them. And, and that's why I mentioned earlier, go to Vimeo guys and look at Houdini student reel and just look what other students are doing. They usually have the hang of it. They, they know what to present in order to be recognized by recruiters. So I guess the best advice I can give you in the beginning is try to specialize on something. Don't try, don't even try to present the whole bandwidth of flip fluids, volumetrics, particle procedural modeling and everything. Try to figure out a way, uh, try to figure out a sort of area that interests you most and try to become really, really good at it. For example, if you do destruction, you should be able to do the rigid body simulation in order to destroy a building. You should be able to create a additional particle debris pass. You should be able to, you know, put smoke onto the, the different uh, destruction uh, uh, sort of, uh, let's say the different structures that uh, collapsed. You should be able to emit smoke from that or even put maybe a little explosion in there. As long as you have a good, um, you know, overall skill level in one different niche, then you can much easier get a job than when you have 10 different effects that are only half baked, you know, and by half baked, I mean, they're not at their highest level in terms of the quality. So try to focus on a little area that interests you and try to create effects that are really, really high quality. And another thing is that um, Emma asked earlier, a good thing to do is to learn Nuke on the side so you can do good compositions of your effects. Because most of the time, um, recruiters want to see something where you, you know, maybe you shot a footage with your cell phone outside and then you, maybe, you know, maybe you go down your, uh, your neighborhood and then you want to just put one of the buildings on fire there. So you film it with your cell phone and then you create, you track that whole thing, you create your digital camera in Houdini and then you basically try to destroy that building. And then you put it in Nuke onto the footage and you make it look real. If you are able to do something like that, then all the better for you, all the power to you because um, you know the more complex your effects look like, the better for your demo reel. But definitely go to Vimeo and check out what other students are doing because that will set the bar of which level you have to achieve in order to get a job in the industry. Yeah, that was, I thought that was a good insight into sort of what you need to do to get into the industry, what you should be focusing on. Um, thanks for that breakdown again. And then I think we'll wrap it up now. It's uh, a little bit late for everyone. That's crazy. 4 a.m. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And, um, Manuel, again, thanks so much for just a great conversation, sort of what goes into being an effects artist, effects lead, and then your, your class that's uh, coming up. Um, and then for our listeners, where, they, where can they connect with you and follow your work online? Oh, guys, um, anywhere, really. Like, you can join me on Vimeo. You can add me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you guys have any additional questions, just uh, shoot them to me. I'll, I'll see if I can quickly grab my Vimeo page and my um, LinkedIn page so I can um, put them into the chat. If you give me a second, I just Google that quickly. I got your but, uh, Vimeo right here. Okay, so why don't you post my Vimeo and I, in the yeah. meantime, check my LinkedIn. But LinkedIn yeah. is really a, a really good platform just to, if you guys want to add me and send me a direct message, I'm on, on LinkedIn at least once a day uh, in order to do my networking. So that's definitely something you can consider. Mm -hmm. And like I said, don't be afraid. If you have any questions, you can always personally hit me up and then uh, we can talk a little bit. 
Um, so I'm just getting that profile here. All right, so here's my LinkedIn. So feel free to add me. And uh, like I said, you can ask me anything really. As long as I have time, we can talk a little. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and then so for everyone else, uh, thank you for tuning in. And please connect with us on Facebook and CG Society Media. And you can watch the webinar replay on cgsociety.org. Um, again, thank you. Thanks for everyone coming out to watch, especially when it's so late. Um, and just take care, everyone. Thanks again, Manuel. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for the invite. And uh, guys, thanks so much for tuning in. And maybe I'll see you in the next iteration of my workshop. That would be definitely a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. See ya. See ya, guys. Good night.